Hello again, this is Timothy Baldridge. Today I want to do a little bit of talking about object-oriented programming. This is going to be the first of several lessons about some thoughts that I've had about OOP and uh, kind of how it's misunderstood in the closure community and, and really in a lot of functional programming languages. But first of all, I want to start with this definition. I got this definition from dictionary.com. I don't always get my programming language theory from dictionary.com, but this one I kind of like. It says, OOP is a schematic paradigm for computer programming in which the linear concepts of procedures and tasks are replaced by the concepts of objects and messages. An object, an object includes a package of data and a description of the operations that can be performed on that data. A message specifies one of the operations, but unlike a procedure, does not describe how the operation should be carried out. C++ is an example of object-oriented programming language. Okay, so, so here's my beef with the closure community sometimes, and, and I see this occasionally. I see people say, something reminds me of object-oriented programming, or this reminds me of OOP. Therefore, this is wrong. And I disagree with that, mostly because no one really understands what OOP is. In fact, going through different sources of definitions of OOP, I found a lot of different sources, and I, and I didn't like some of them, and I like some others, and some I thought were incomplete. And it seems more that OOP is, is um, viewed as something like here, it's mentioned in this last line, C++ is an example of an object-oriented programming language. It is, but that doesn't mean it's the end-all and be-all of OOP. So what I'd like to do in this lesson and upcoming lessons is to explore various aspects of OOP and talk about what's good and what's bad about the design and why, and, or why we use it sometimes and, and why we don't. Now there are aspects of OOP in Clojure, um, aspects of OOP that are frowned upon in Clojure, and we'll get to those as we go on. So we have here, so this is a schematic paradigm of computer programming in which we replace certain concepts with concepts of objects and messages. So let's, let's define something today. Let's specify what this object is. We're going to have ops is one part of our object, and ops is going to have several functions, which we'll define in a little bit. And then we'll also have another bit of data called data. So what we're going to do here is um, we're going to have scores be uh, a list, an empty list at this point. But what we're going to do is, pro is provide several op uh, ops that we can perform on this object, namely add and sum. Okay. So add score is going to be a function that takes state and it's going to return a new state. And then we're going to have something called sum scores. It's going to sum up all the scores that we currently have. So our function add score is going to take state and an additional score, and it's going to simply update the state. And we're just going to conj the score. into the uh, state, right? And then down here, we're going to sum scores. And we're going to sum these scores by simply saying, we're, we're just going to sum up the contents of scores. So we're going to apply plus to the uh, get in of state at data and scores. So here's our two option operators, and, and in fact, this data is now like our pre-constructed state of this of this object. So we fulfill the first part of this definition, and that we have operations and we have data. Boom. So now let's um, let's uh, define send message to object and args. So this is going to be our generic send operation uh, uh, function, and what we're going to do is we're going to get the op from the object. And we're going to do that by going in, uh, we need another arg here, which is um, command, right? Or the message type, we'll name it message type, message type. So we're going to get in the object um, ops and message type. 
right? That gets us our op. Then we're going to simply return uh, the result of applying uh, the op to the object passing in the args. Okay. So let's get this, give this a try. Uh, we will have, here we go, let's do this. We're going to do, uh, we'll start with my object and then send message add score 42, send message add score one, and then we're just going to call uh, send, send message of uh, uh, some scores. And if we run this, we get 43. This right here is the essence of object-oriented programming. We have transformate, we have state and transformations of state in the same location. And we abstract that away by referencing the transformations by name. Right, so we don't have anything here that says, okay, you know, what is add score? It it doesn't matter at all, right? Um, we just simply have uh, keywords that are referencing these functions. Now, what's kind of interesting about this system, right, is that this is pretty much polymorphic right now. We can do all sorts of things with this, right? We could um, we could, for instance, say um, we want to have a, an additional method on here, right? Um, my object two, and this is going to update in uh, my object in ops, and we're just going to uh, actually tell you what we're going to do: association. My object, and we're going to do ops uh, average score, and the function for this is going to look a lot. Like what we had before. Um, but instead, what we're going to do this time is we're going to do get in uh, state data scores, right? So we're going to get our data, and then once we have the scores, we can just do a simple average, which of course is the uh, sum of the scores divided by the count, right? So apply plus to scores, count scores, right? So now we have an inherited system. We can do some object two, and let's see here, oh, we need to add that into our REPL, there we go, some object two, and now we have at, uh, some scores is still there, and if we do average scores, uh, let's see here. We have a problem with uh, our state here. Let's take a look at what my object 2 looks like. Okay, let's see my object two. And here's our state. So we have uh, average score, not uh, average scores. We should probably change that. 43 divided by two, all right. Closure in your ratios. There we go, 21. All right, that works great. So we have inheritance, boom. We could also override certain functions. So we have, you know, be the ability to say, hey, we want to sum scores a different way, or we want to add scores in a, uh, a, a certain different way, maybe store them in a, ha in a hash set or, or something, right? But this right here is the essence of object-oriented programming. We have messages that we apply to a data state that transforms that data state. And the messages themselves do not contain the logic. They are references to logic, or like pointers or um, names for the logic in the object itself. Now, one thing I want to point out with this in this lesson is that nothing here is mutable. There is absolutely nothing here that has to do with A, encapsulation, or mutability, right? 
This is a completely immutable object-oriented system. It is also um, completely open at any time. You know, we can we can add send message, send message here, um, and uh, let's just comment out these two lines. And what do we get? We get the state of our object, right? These are immutable objects. So when we say object-oriented programming is bad in a certain way, we have to really think about what it is we're talking about, and we'll explain that more in the next lessons. But here, let's take a little bit of time and do examine what something that is, that is kind of maybe not so good in this case. Now, now, what is that thing that's not so good? Well, it is the combination of state here with the logic on that state, right? Now, sometimes you may want this. Um, if we are simply saying, you know, some scores, well, what if I have another thing here? What if I have something like, uh, um, instead of scores, we have, um, for each score, we have number of, um, you know, uh, let's, let's say these scores came from a, um, a, a basketball game or something like that, right? And we also have, you know, game ID. So we have a whole bunch of IDs associated with the scores. Right, we can't deal with that data in a generic way. We can't say well, we would have to have an additional function for count scores and count games. Right, we would have to have multiple um, uh, objects in that case, we, and then we'd have to have getters. So we, we could deal with this in a generic way by having like get scores, get games, and then we can count that data. You know, so so that's kind of the problem. Um, that can be seen as a good thing in some cases, maybe, that you don't want people mucking around with that state, so you're going to hide it away. But it does reduce the visibility. So, to start with, you have to ask, is it worth it? What are you trying to do? Now, maybe you want to define a very clear-cut interface, and we'll talk about that in, a, in future lessons. Things like protocols and multi-methods may allow you to do that, right? So, um, this is a good starting point, though. This shows how we can we can conform to a really simple description of object-oriented programming while yet not introducing mutability and also um, not introducing uh, like a opaque state of that sort. We can still get to the data if we want to. All right, that's the tutorial for today. Be, be sure to come back and uh, watch the others about object-oriented programming coming soon. Thank you.